my fault. See, Randy, you'll never hear me admit that. So. Anything mentionable is manageable. And a lot of times when we talk about the book of Revelation, people get freaked out because there's some crazy illustrations in there. There's some, some crazy descriptions of what's going on. Um, but we're going to talk about it today, and I want to talk about it in a way to encourage you not just to think of eternity or heaven being this way out distant thing, but understand that God has invited you into his presence. And today when we talk about uh, this next chapter of Revelation, we're going to be talking about three things that really practically uh, you, you have the opportunity to allow heaven to touch you every day and to allow your mind to be refocused on what's really matters. It's so easy in this life to get focused on the wrong things. And you know, these big situations sometimes refocus us. Yesterday morning, I started the day by visiting hospice, an old friend who I've known since his girls who are 20-something were born. Uh, my first visit, twins uh, in the hospital. And, um, and he then last night during church, I got a text that he had passed away yesterday. And so life is just one of those things. It's weird for pastors. We're, we're, I know you know pastors are weird, right? I'm extra weird, but that's for a different reason. And so, you know, you're dealing with that. And then um, I get home and one of the neighbors has lost their dog. And so we're out looking for their dog. It's a greyhound. Did you know you can't catch a greyhound? Did you know that? Anyway, so, uh, but they had a drone. You could hear the drone last night flying. I, okay, I probably shouldn't tell you this. So I ordered a drone. <clears throat> I had... I have points on my credit card, and you can order stuff. And last night I said, I'm getting a drone. I'm going to help next time. I'm going to help. I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm not just going to drive around in circles, which is what I did. But anyway, so um, a lot of you have known me for a while, but I, I haven't told, I don't think I've told this story ever. Uh, it's a little embarrassing, so, which is not unusual for any story I tell. So... Um, by the way, Spolstra, just so you know, Iowa, Pella, Iowa, if you want to see, a, and you Pella Windows, you've heard of that? If you want to see a windmill, go visit them. It's amazing. They've got a windmill in town and all that stuff. And Joy, you get out there often? Every week. It's worth it during the summer, especially. It's beautiful, beautiful place. But anyway, so we're glad to have all of you guys here this morning. And I want to thank you for being here. And Randy, we work Randy to death all the time, and so we're very grateful, and we appreciate you. So we're going to let you know that. So, all right. So years ago, I was asked to be a part of a presidential motorcade, and Kristen asked me this morning, which president? And I said, I have no idea. I said, honestly, if you inquisitioned me, I would say, I think it was this one, but I'm not sure. And actually, I was part of the motorcade for the vice president who was coming out. I can't remember if it was to see a shuttle launch or a shuttle landing. And here's why I can't remember. You're going to figure this out in a second. So, um, so I signed up, and, and she said, how did you get to do that? I go, I don't know. I signed up. And so I was in this big black vehicle. You know, they always rent these huge, they must have a deal, some politician has a deal with Chevy. Anyway, and they give money to their campaign, and suddenly we have to rent Chevy's Tahoes for everything. But anyway, so um, we're in this huge line, and we go and pick them up at the hotel, and I get no-name people in my car, of course, and, you know, I don't know who they are, but they're nice. And, and so I drive them to the Space Center, and um, I drop them off, and they come out and say, we don't need your help. Thank you for coming. You can go over to the landing pad and just wait for us to be done, and then you can come back and pick up. So I didn't even get to watch whatever it was we were watching. They sent me over to the, to the pad, and I went to this little building. The building is teeny, and I'm sitting there with several people. Well, out on the landing pad is Air Force One. And uh, one of the um, uh, dignitaries or whatever came in and said to me, do you want to go on Air Force One? To which I said, yes, that'd be great. And the other people, I always said, yes, we'll go on Air Force One. That'll be great. So they... Uh, they get everything ready. They do background something or other. We start walking out to Air Force One, and the uh, special agent uh, says to me, I'm sorry, your check didn't go through. You can't get on. I got all the way to the steps, 
the other people kept going. They went on, they come off, and so I say to them, so what was it like? A third grader could have described Air Force One better. They were like, ah, it's just a plane, lots of seats, and um, it's really kind of cool, you know, but, uh, and like no description at all. I'm just like, this is like an ADD nightmare. What is wrong with these people, right? And so as I was thinking about the sermon today, I thought, you know, here's John. He gets called into heaven, and he's trying to describe it to us, and it's beyond our comprehension. I remember in seminary, one of the seminary professors said, it's like an Eskimo meeting a Hawaiian, and the Hawaiian is trying to tell the Eskimo what a coconut is like. By the way, I scream like that all the time in church, so... I'm so sorry. You're doing great. So here's the thing we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to answer heaven's call today. And if you have your Bible, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 4. And I'm going to give you three practical things. Most people don't think of the book of Revelation as practical. But I want to give you three things today, this afternoon, tomorrow morning, that you can do to get on Air Force One. Okay? That you can do to say, God, I want to know your presence. So let's pick up number one. First of all, a call into God's presence. Here it goes. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, Come up here. And um, that's the same word as when Jesus came out of the water, and it literally means, Come up here. I know, that's deep, deep Greek. And I'll show you what may, must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. Once again, he's trying to describe the indescribable. Okay? So, like jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. By the way, have you ever seen... Somebody last night came up to me after church and said... You know, one night I was headed home from the Space Center and I saw the most amazing cloud formation. I mean, if you could have told me it looked like heaven to me. Have you ever seen something, whether it was a rainbow? I saw a rainbow last Saturday night on the way to church or, or something that just was, wow. And everybody who's been, how many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, I've never been to the Grand Canyon. And I've seen pictures of the Grand Canyon. And everybody says the same thing to me. I have a friend that does tours of the Grand Canyon. And I have a friend that said to me, hey, <laughs> Watson. I love Watson. I got to read him a book last week. I was so excited. Um, but my friend always says to me, you, you don't understand. A picture does not do it justice. And the truth is, John is trying to describe heaven. And can I tell you a secret? His description does not do it justice. It's beyond anything we could describe. So he continues. And then he says, Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white, had crowns of gold on their heads. And all of these things are symbolic. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Now I want you to think about what the big picture is. The big picture is that God says to John, come up here. Come be in my presence. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody intimidating. My friends used to tell me that my dad was intimidating, that they were afraid of my dad. My dad was a pretty big guy and a really strong guy. He actually scared a church member one night really late and made him wet his pants. But, um, uh, it's well, he scared him first. That's what you get. But anyway, so, so the truth is, right, we all know somebody's intimidating. People, when I was watching a, a little special on Princess Bride, how many of you ever seen Princess Bride? How many know who Andre the Giant is? Everybody knows. If you don't know who Andre the Giant is, you need to Google it. And um, anyway, so, but here's what they said about Andre the Giant. A lot of people, when they first meet Andre the Giant, he's very big, and so they're very intimidating, but then they got to know him, and he was like the nicest person in the world. Now, they also said that he could put his hand over your head and pick you up and move you if he wanted to. I mean, he was immensely powerful, and yet you didn't have to be afraid around him. Here's God calling John to heaven to this 
unbelievable, undescribable vision. And yet, God is saying, I want you to see this. And so here's what I want to say to you today. God wants you to know His presence in your life. As powerful as God is, and you need to recognize His power. You need to honor Him, understanding that God is all-powerful, and yet... He calls you into his presence. How do I know that? Because in Hebrews 4.16, it says it very simply. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We all need God's grace. So many people are walking through hard things right now. And maybe you're here today and you're one of those people, you're walking through something difficult. Maybe somebody you know is walking through a tragedy or a struggle and you don't know how to help them. Best way to help them? Approach God's throne of grace and say, God, would you help my friend? God, I don't even know what to say to them. I don't know how to help them. I don't know what I could say or do to make a difference. But Lord, could you give them your grace? By the way, one of the things it says in the Bible that I love, it says he's the God of all comfort. So sometimes that's what I pray for people. God, you're the God of all comfort. Should you give them some of that? Just right now that in the middle of what they're going through, what they're walking through, what they're dealing with, that you would give them your comfort. So here's my first challenge, encouragement to you. Enjoy God's presence in the word and prayer. Now, if you want to take a nap after this in the sermon, Billy, if you're going to take a nap, this is a good time right after this, okay? Here's the most important part of the sermon. Spend daily time in God's word, but don't just spend time in his word just reading it like you would a a pouring spaghetti, water on spaghetti in a pot, right? Take time to say, God, Help me to know your presence as I read your word. God, as I spend time in prayer, help me to grasp the idea that the all-powerful, almighty God who created all things is listening, is paying attention to what I'm saying. And the truth is, God can also, while you're reading his word, while you're spending time in prayer, he can actually inspire you, encourage you, remind you. The Bible says that he convicts us of sin and of righteousness. So it means he not only shows us sometimes what's in our lives that's messed up, but he also can show us what to do that's right. Number two, a call to holiness. Now I was watching a show on barbecue, which shows you how I was sick this week and I would watch anything. And they were showing these guys cooking barbecue And they had these gloves on. Have you guys seen the guys with barbecue with these gloves on? And I saw them with these gloves, and they get the barbecue. Oh, gosh. See, Michelle, you're not the only one. Now I can't. I've turned it inside out. So, okay. So they're doing that. You may just get one glove if this doesn't go well. There we go. Okay. So they're doing the barbecue. They pull it off the grill, right? And then they got somebody on there, somebody famous, and they're saying, now, you flip it over and you can see the line, and they're, they're touching the barbecue, and then they get a knife, and they're cutting up the barbecue, and then he puts it on a plate, and the other guy, mmm, that's delicious barbecue, and they keep touching it with their hands, with these gloves on, and you got to realize, I'm freaking out a little bit. Now, let me tell you why. Because I have these gloves. These came from my house in my garage. I've got a whole hundred pack of these gloves. But at my house, they're not for barbecue. I have a septic system. And any time you see these on me and I'm in my yard, it means I have too many children. That's what that means, right? And so, and so if you see me with these on, I am not having barbecue. Now, let me tell you the dumbest thing you could ever do is find a used pair of these gloves at my house and handle barbecue with them. <laughs> Listen to me. That's the definition of holiness. Holiness literally means to be set apart for a special purpose. So these gloves are great if you use them for barbecue. As long is you don't then come to my house and use them for septic. And the truth is, God has called you and I to holiness, but too often we allow sin and other things to 
get into our lives and to cause us to be impure and to struggle. And then we wonder. Now, the good news about God is he purifies our hearts and he gives us his holiness. Look at what it says about holiness in heaven, Revelation 3, 6 through 8. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass. And I love it. He kind of says, you know, the coconut is kind of like whale blubber. I mean, he's like a seal. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been on the ocean when it just looked amazing and you could see right through it. Like if you've ever been down to the Keys and, you know, you look through the water. Maybe you've been in the Bahamas and you look and you're just like, whoa, can I tell you something? This is that times whatever. It looks like glass. He sees right through it. And then it continues. Clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures Covered with eyes in front and in back. And so what is he saying? It is freaky. The first kind of looked like a lion. The second kind of like an ox. The third with a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. And he's describing something undescribable. Each of the four living creatures had six wings covered with eyes all around. And under its wings, uh, excuse me, even under its wings. Now, but here's, here's the part that we can do something about. Here we go. Day and night. They never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. All day long they're saying, God is so set apart from sin. There's no impurity in it. There's no, we, he is unreachable to us because of his holiness. And yet what Jesus does for us is so awesome. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 7. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. What? Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. See, there's this awesome truth that when you become a Christian and you surrender your life to God, He gives you, he, it's called imputing, He gives you His holiness and yet, what do we do? Sometimes we handle other things with the holiness He's given us, right? And the good news is we can come back to God and say, Father, forgive me. And He gives you new gloves. It says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Not only forgive, what does He do? Purifies us from all unrighteousness. New gloves. And so you don't have to live in that lifestyle and continue to live that way. So, so here's some things I want you to think about when it comes to holiness, because we tend to think of holiness as this vague concept. So let me just give you some things that we struggle with, all right? We struggle with our thought life. We struggle with how we treat others. But we also struggle a lot with pride. Has there been any time this week that you thought, well, I'm a lot smarter than that person? I mean, even if you're watching the news and you think, well, those people are just dumb, that's pride. That's arrogance. And yet it sneaks in. Doesn't it just sneak in? I'm just a little better than them, right? I know a little better. I, I, got, I, got, I, watched, I watched a thing on YouTube, so I'm smarter than they are, right? I mean, that's, that's really a problem now, by the way. I get, you should see what the emails I get. But anyway... It, and so we need to repent. What does repent mean? Turn around. God, forgive me for thinking I'm better than people. You ready for this? Selfishness. Selfishness sneaks in. You know how quick selfishness sneaks in? Selfishness sneaks in when you see a merge lane and somebody runs up past you and you're like, no. <laughs> Did you ever think about that being selfishness and self-centeredness? It is. It is. By the way, they've done studies that if you pull up behind somebody in a parking lot and you honk, they actually take longer to leave the parking space. Even though they could care less. They're trying to leave and you're trying to get in. What's the big deal? Why? Selfishness. For all of us. It just sneaks in. And so we have to say, God, would you forgive me of my self-centeredness, my way of looking at life, my way of thinking I'm a little better than other people, my thinking I have it all together. God, I just surrender all that to you knowing that you are all powerful. You're holy. You are righteous. You are set apart. So here's the second challenge. Repent and renew to be set apart. Now, I love this from Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis says this, and it's a great description of heaven. I have come home at last. This is my real country. 
I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come further up, come further in. Listen, one of the things I love when I do a funeral, I don't enjoy funeral. But when I know somebody's had a relationship with Christ, I know that they're having a much better day than I'm having. I know that when I sit on the beach and I see a perfect sunset and all of a sudden I feel that overwhelming peace, that's just a taste of heaven. And here's what I want you to know. When you're spending time in the Bible, when you're listening to praise music, when you're just getting still, did you know you, before you get to heaven, you can experience just a touch of that peace that God wants to give you? Some of you need that today. You just need to have His peace. Some of you maybe need a sprinkle of joy. You know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience. I don't know anybody who needs that. There's no lightning in the area, is there? Number three, not yet. Number three, a call to worship. I remember Peter Lord, I think he actually said this at a wedding, and I, I'm, I'm not, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he said it at a wedding. He could definitely blurt some things. And he one time was talking about marriage. And he said, imagine if uh, you went to get married and your husband said, I'm going to marry you, but once a year, I'm going to go out with somebody else. Now, if you're not Will Smith, that is a bizarre thing to say, right? None of us would accept that. Normal people would not accept that, right? The truth is, when we talk about worship, what is worship? Worship is surrendering to God. God, I'm wholly yours. Worship is not just about songs. Songs are a way to worship. They're a way to express worship. But worship's about surrendering to Him. Listen to what worship looks like in heaven. It's a pretty awesome sight. Whenever the living creatures give glory and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever... The 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns, listen, before the throne and say, You're worthy, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their beings. You ever heard somebody say, When you get to heaven, you're going to get a better crown because you did this? I remember years ago we had Sunday night church and nobody came except for like my family and like three other families, right? You had like 100 people and you had 1,000 people on Sunday morning and 100 people on Sunday night. So the pastor would say things like, you're all getting a crown for coming tonight because he didn't want to preach to nobody. Truth be known, when you get a crown, guess what you're going to do when you get to heaven? You know what, God? I don't deserve any of these honors. Let me give you a practical way to live that out. I heard this years ago from a Christian speaker. And they said every time they spoke, you know, people would come up and say, that was a great sermon or that was a great talk. And they said they used to say, oh, no, no, no. And then they realized that what they were doing is basically telling the person it was terrible. And so they learned just to say thank you. And then they said, and what I do is every night... Any compliment that I've gotten, any accolade that I've earned, any award that I've been given, I lift them up as roses to the Lord and say, Lord, you know these are because of you. In heaven, that's how it's going to be. Like, I got this crown, I got this accolade, I got this important thing, I got promoted at work, I had all this happen, and God, it's only because of you. I had this situation work out in my life, this marriage work out in my life, these kids work out in my life, I had this thing, but God, it's only because of you. And by the way, when you compare your children to other people's children, when you compare your job to other people's job, when you compare your work ethic to other people's work ethic, when you compare whatever, recognize all the good comes from God. And so God, without you, I wouldn't even be able to do this. God, without you, I wouldn't even be able to think this way. God, without you, I wouldn't have the power. And so we lay our crowns before him in humility, recognizing who he is. Listen to what it says in Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The final challenge today is surrender every part of your life to Christ. In the song, Make Room, over and over it says, I surrender. I surrender. What a great song. Lord, I just surrender these areas to you. I surrender these moments to you. 
I really want you every day to be able to enter into God's presence. Now imagine if when I went to Air Force One, we're going to go back to the beginning. Imagine when I went to Air Force One, I walked up and that Secret Service agent said, uh, yeah, you can't come on. Imagine if at that point the president walked out and said, uh, no, he's with me and waved me on. That's a picture of heaven. When the thief on the cross got there and the angel said, why should we let you into heaven? He's like, I don't know. That guy said to come. And Jesus is like, come with me. So the question today is, do you know Christ? Have you surrendered your life to him? That's what it means to be a Christian. So if you're here and you want to surrender your life to Christ, you can do that after the service. I'll be here. We're going to sing a song. We're going to have an offering. But I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Maybe today you're a Christian, but you've been so focused on the world that you forget that God can bring heaven into your living room. God can bring heaven, listen to this, into your car. He can bring heaven into your presence, even in a meeting at the Space Center. And so begin to live that way. Say, God, I want to live in your presence. Thank you for inviting me into your presence. Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. Lord, I thank you that you invite us into your presence. May we live that way. Father, I pray even today that we would know more of your presence. Lord, for that one today that's struggling, would you give them your peace? Lord, for that one today that needs your comfort, would you give them your comfort? For that one today wondering what they need to do next, Father, would you give them peace and give them an answer to their question. Lord, guide us in all things. May we walk in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song to close our service. We're going to have our time.